Yeah, yeah, it's cool. So is this live or is it going to be? No, uh, no, no, we're not, we're not live. We're not... First and most important question probably is you played your live gig last weekend and it was your first live gig in several months. So how did you feel? Well, how did it how did it go? Yeah, it was first gig in um first gig in 13 months. So a year and a month. Um it was an outdoor concert in, in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. See. Ah. And um yeah, it was great. Everyone was very distant. It was like an outdoor movie mm -hmm. thing in this big parking lot outdoor movie theater so uh yeah it was but it was great it was it was very strange to do that again okay what yeah kind of, what, what kind of stuff did you play actually it was all uh improvised music with uh helen chalet and pedro segundo from portugal and helen is from Belgium, but uh, also raised in Singapore and lives in New Orleans for many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's, a, she's a cellist. Okay, okay. Uh, how, mm -hmm. did you, how did you meet them, or did you? Is it like long going association, or? Well, I've been I've been going to New Orleans to play music for, geez, almost twenty five years, so. I've met Helen down there many years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, and we've been good friends and playing together ever since. There's some, you know, outdoor shows in certain parts of the country, um, but it's not very widespread mm -hmm. and not very much so uh, where I'm from in Seattle. So, um, but I just got an email today for um, friends of mine are doing a gig in California outdoor show in July. Mm -hmm. So I might go down there for that. Um, yeah, there it's you don't see it very much right now, but it's happening. It's terrible. I got my second shot, though. Oh, congratulations. Yeah. How do you, how do Have you, you been? I feel fine. Yeah, uh, much better, much better cell reception. <laughs> and I hear Bill Gates's voice in my head all the time. Okay, okay. Sorry. Well, you know, um, do you know this band I used to play in, Critters Buggin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Critters Buggin, our second record, which came out in um, 1995, 1996. Bill Gates was building this huge house that he lives in now, right? In Seattle. In Seattle. Okay. Yeah. And so he was building this big, giant house, and it had all this fancy computer-controlled house. You know, you walk in the door, you say things, and stuff happens. Okay? So um, a fan of our band, Critters Buggin, was using our CD as a test CD to test the audio system. <laughs> and because um, and I had a song on there. It, it's called Bill Gates. <laughs> and this guy's it's a crazy you got to listen to it. So uh, it's on the Critters Buggin record called Host. Yeah, I don't I, think and the, I have this one. actually. Yeah, yeah you can out. check it out online and. Um, or you go to CrittersBuggin.com. You can check it out there too but uh yeah you should hear it it's pretty fun it's pretty funny but he the fact that he played that in his house <laughs> it's pretty crazy it's good and did, did bill gates <laughs> start to go to your come to your shows or did he buy a cd or two no <laughs> no way those people are repelled by our music it's the opposite of success <laughs> i don't know <laughs> I still don't know. I, I'm very lucky to have met those people there, and I love it. And you know, it's a big part of my life. But you know, uh, 
there was a producer named Dan Prothero who produced the first Stanton Moore solo record called All Cooped Out. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that record? Mm -hmm. This guy, Dan Prothero, he was a producer in San Francisco, California. And he, um, I had been working with him. Uh, he was doing a lot of stuff with the label Ubiquity out of the Bay Area. And then he had met Stanton. And so I think he recommended me to Stanton. You know, hey, you should check this sax player out. Scarrick, you know, you might like him. So we met when they were on tour, I think. And we hit it off, you know, and we've been best friends ever since. So, in fact, that first record, All Cooked Out, <clears throat> that's what the record, you know, that's the original group that played on that like 20, 22 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, that's, the re that's the same group that's on that record that's behind you of the OG Gap so it's the original Garage mm -hmm. so we did Stanton's first record together and then we also put out a record called Mystery Funk so our new record Calm Down Cologne it's the same people that were on that all cooked out but there's other musicians on that record too there's other saxophone players and tuba and you know, brass band kind of stuff. There, you know, there's all there's different people, but mostly it's us. You know, the three of us. Well, yeah, it's 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 the mech it's the mecca of, you know, rhythmic music in in the U.S. You know, like all jazz, funk, soul, anything with a backbeat comes from New Orleans. Mm -hmm. You know, the historical significance of that city cannot be underestimated or, or denied in any way you know what i mean uh, louis yeah. armstrong you know everyone you know it's just it's an incredible history and a painful history too for black americans but i mean it's the home of black american music is was created there so when i go there it's a very spiritual and you know heavy and very fun time you know to go there and it's a and it's a place of learning you know um i i didn't get turned on to that music until later you know my dad was listening to some james brown and things like that but only in the car like on the radio mm -hmm when I was a kid. So I had, it was much later after high school, I got turned on to like real, you know, the, the real music, mm -hmm. you know, Miles Davis and, you know, Wayne Shorter and the meters and all that, all the good stuff, you know, okay. uh... yeah, much later. No. No. no, that's a very singular, specific study that requires a a very specific commitment and skill set. And I, I am a you know much more of an improviser and sonic person. You know, I'll play some keyboards or put saxophone through effects. You know, I like creating you know music and moments. I practice jazz and, and listen to jazz musicians a lot but you know it's the I, there's very few mu jazz musicians that i know you know what i mean that that's a very singular pure commitment you know and it's yeah it's uh, it's a it's a very deep art and it, it yeah you know i do wait i do all this other i do all these other things that you couldn't call it a jazz musician at all <laughs> okay uh, maybe when i grow up i could be a jazz musician. <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's people's personalities and then what they're drawn to you know what kind of 
what kind of musics do they like um and what resonates and what calls you you know the music is a it's a powerful calling you and when when you receive these messages you know you have to just respond you know you just have to go you have to do it mm-hmm. you know you don't really have a choice you know you just you know you're doing it so everything i listen you know i grew up playing um classical music playing in symphonies i played clarinet for one year mm-hmm. but i only play saxophone really since sixth grade mostly tenor and baritone saxophone and soprano very once in a while seldom because mm-hmm. when i was a kid i was listening to lots of classical music and like Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and you know a lot of rock stuff Mm -hmm. you know so I was really into rock music and you know symphonic music so and I played in you know you in school playing some jazz stuff but not really playing it you know not feeling it not connecting with it not really studying it properly it wasn't until way after school that I started meeting people that had deeper knowledge of that art form and you know started studying it a little bit more yeah that was you know Seattle was smaller then so more people knew each other it's still kind of small in a way in the music community. So a lot of people know each other and work with each other and, you know, share things. The drummer for that band, Mad Season, he was really, he has become, you know, a really good friend of mine. And he had a very open mind. So he loved music from all over the world and was very curious about different things. So it wasn't, you know it wasn't difficult for him to think of oh I want to put some vibraphone on this song or oh I want to put you know we should have Skerrick play some saxophone on one song you know so yeah I'm really glad that he had that that vision and that feeling you know to include it is it's fun I think it were I think it works it still works today still sounds okay yeah um critters buggin our band was on stone gossard's record label for many years he's a really good friend of mine and i've played with pearl jam a couple of times um matt played with mad season and you know everyone just kind of knows each other Mm -hmm. it's not that big a deal you know I mean, I don't know some of them as well because I play, so probably because I play saxophone. If I played guitar, some of them, I, might, I might know them better. Okay. <laughs> but I'm very happy to know those guys. There's the people in the bands in Seattle are really cool. The, those bigger bands, um, the guys in Soundgarden and Pearl Jam, they're, they're very unpretentious. You know, there a lot of people think of them as like rock stars or whatever, but they're very humble mm-hmm. people, very generous people too. They're philanthropic um, enterprises and attitudes are very deep. They very quietly um, give and, and help uh, a lot of people. It's it's pretty it's pretty incredible actually. Mm-hmm. So I have a lot of respect for them and. And they're just cool people, you know, it's not a big deal. It's not like in LA in the eighties or something It's glam rock star bullshit, you know, you know what I mean? Just the excess and the ego. Seattle was never a part of that. And that's what helped create that music in a way. I'm sure it's had some component in it, you know. Uh, it was a, you know, that, that Nirvana, and those band that, that was a rebellion to all that, you know, pretentious 80s bullshit, you know, music coming, you know, from Los 
Los Angeles at that time. It was a reaction to that. So that's why it sounds and looks that way. Well, I, I think I met less in um, uh, 2000 or 2001, something like that, maybe 2000. <clears throat> and his manager was a, a new me and recommended me for a new band that he was putting together. So uh, we just kind of hit it off when we met, when I met Les, and we've been good friends ever since. So I still play with him. Uh, he does the bastard jazz now. <laughs> so we do gigs, you know, maybe once or twice a year as a bastard jazz. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so he's really great. You know, he's a, he, he always knows exactly what he wants to do and what sounds he wants and you know he's crafting a whole concept you know what I mean lyrically musically and um what the musicians are wearing you know the stage what the stage looks like everything and I really like people that have a full concept like that that's Critters Buggin was kind of like that in a more loose loose way but Les has a very strong vision of a, it's like performance art, but with music, you know, and he's an amazing bass player <clears throat> and he's super funky. So, but he likes weird stuff too. You know, he likes, you know, his, his favorite music is, you know, the residents mm -hmm. and Tom Waits. So it's like residents, Tom Waits and Rush. That's his, <laughs> that's what, that's what, that's what, uh, that's what it sounds like when we when we play with Rush with uh, Les, you know. But he's a good friend, you know. We're we're good friends, and <clears throat> yeah, I was very excited to meet him back in the day and start playing with him. It was it was very it was a good time. I played in his band for like seven or eight years straight, a lot of touring, mm. and then and then. Um, just ever since then it's just kind of been he'll add me when he needs an extra thing voice and yeah so which is cool I'm always happy to play with him he was very open to uh long solo sections and mm -hmm. for things to happen you know he wanted things to happen in the music that was different every night so it's good good for good for me and then, there, you know, there's lots of songs to learn, too. Lots of parts and everything. But, you know, a lot of improvising. He's a very good improviser. He's very strategic, you know, very compositional in his, improv in, in his improvising. You know, so it's like um, Wayne Shorter is a good quote from Wayne Shorter. He goes, composition is improvisation slowed down. <laughs> improvisation is composition sped up. It was great. He always had a really good crew. I'm still good friends with a lot of the crew. <clears throat> so, but no, I had, I had toured with Roger Waters before. Yeah, and so we were in a private jet <laughs> <laughs> and not a tour bus. So okay. uh, that was even crazier, much crazier. Yeah. But yeah, so, but less like that. He he'd heard that I played with Roger Waters, and he was like, "Oh, I want to play with. I'll check Scarrick out." You know, he liked mm -hmm. the fact that I played with him, so it was good. But yeah, touring is fun. You know, I like touring in the van with punk rock kids, or or being in the bus, or flying. I don't care what it is. I, I like to. I want to play every night. Uh, um, well, I was in a band called Sad Happy in like 1990, 91, and uh, 92. And uh, someone from Roger Waters' record label, Columbia Records, he had remembered me, <clears throat> remembered about me. And so they were looking for a saxophone player. They were hiring saxophone players regionally in the US. Mm -hmm. 
And so he recommended me. So I remember going home one day and there was a, uh, a message on my answering machine. You know, it was before internet, you know, no, like, uh, no cell phone and stuff. And uh, he was like, hey, this is such and such, you know, can you, can you play with Roger? Can you talk to Roger Waters' manager? <laughs> I was like, fuck yeah, I can. <clears throat> so uh, I was really into that. So his manager called me and he's like, what are you, what kind of music are you into? And I told him, he goes, oh, that's great. You know, I told him I was, you know, like King Curtis and John Coltrane or things like that. And, um, yeah, so I met them at the hotel in Seattle. And then we went to the private jet in the van and I met Roger on the jet. <clears throat> and um, it was, it was weird because when we're flying over to, we, we're playing this big concert place called the Gorge. So that's where big concerts are held in, if you, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. You can do like 15, 20,000 people, I think. So anyway, we're flying there in the jet and all of a sudden the captain comes back and him and Roger are looking out the window, right? In the main part of the plane. And it's just a bunch of big leather couches in there and stuff. You know, it's not like seats, like a commercial jet. And so they were looking out the window and they were talking and the other pilot was flying really low and slow, which makes it go up and down. I was getting really sick, really not I was feeling nauseous, you know, because it's but they were talking and pointing and everything. I was like, what are they talking about? <clears throat> and so we land and I go there. And we go to sound check, right? And so I stand, they go, you go stand right next to Roger. So it's just him and I in the front of the stage and everyone else is like really far back, right? The rest of the band. And we're all playing, you know, sound check. And he goes, okay, play the solo. Let's play money. You know, doom, dee, be doo, boom, 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 boom. Okay, so you know that song is in seven, right? Mm -hmm. Seven, four. Okay, seven, right? Okay. So playing in odd meters is, it's not difficult. Like a song like that makes it easy, makes it easier. But what is difficult in playing in odd meters is counting long notes <laughs> and reps that's that's hard so you know i grew up listening to that solo just like you everyone knows that solo right so you can't make a mistake mm. if you make a mistake playing because he wanted me to play the solo on the record so i was like oh my god you know you have to play it and it's not i don't think the saxophone player on the record played it that way all the way through it's, it sounds like the tape was cut and they they use some different solos together um we have to we should ask alan parsons or I'm like, is he still alive? So I'm on stage and I play it, right? And, at, and then after the solo, Roger stops the band, okay? This is that sound check, right? Mm. And then there's a guy walking down the stadium. There's no one in the stadium, you know? And he's walking down and everyone starts clapping in the band. And so, but that guy's not reacting. The guy's walking down and I was like, what's going on? And so then I turn around and look and they're all looking at me. And so he goes, oh, congratulations. You're one of the first guys to, to play it correctly. <laughs> so, so I got to, I got the gig. So I didn't know it was an audition. I thought okay. I already had the gig. Okay. Yeah. So that like, and I asked the, I asked the keyboard player later, like, well, what would have happened if I didn't play it right? He's like, oh, they would have just paid you and sent you home. And I would have played the solo on the keyboard. <laughs> they, they went on tour with a saxophone player, but he had visa problems. Okay. okay. So yeah, so um, he couldn't make it. So they had to hire people. 
and it was very frustrating for them. They had some inconsistencies. Mm. So, um, but so during the gig, right? So I'm waiting to play, right? And I go out to the sound console and all the people are there, you know, there's it's packed, right? And this is an outdoor amphitheater, okay? Mm -hmm. And below it is a river, okay? So it's like you look at the stage and then behind it is this giant, you know, canyon, right? Where it goes down into a river. It's called the Gorge Amphitheater. Hi, babe, love you. And um, so we're, I'm watching them start the show, right? And everyone is going crazy, right? Because Roger hasn't toured in so long, 10 or 15 years, right? And he's playing all of the Pink Floyd songs that he wrote. That's wow. how he advertised the tour. So everyone's really excited to hear these songs by him, the ones that he sang, you know, and he the ones that he wrote. So everyone's just like, ah, right? And so the band comes out, it's all dark, the stage is dark, right? So everyone comes out on stage and people are going, ah, and I'm starting to get really nervous, <laughs> okay? And I'm watching from the sound booth next to the sound person, okay? So I'm watching all this. And then you can tell it's Roger, it's all dark, stage is dark, okay? The show hasn't started yet, okay? And Roger gets on this special stage that goes over the stage, mm -hmm. okay? And he walks up there and people are going really crazy now. They're just going nuts, they're screaming. Ah! You know, they just like, everyone's losing their mind and the stage is dark, there's no music yet, okay? You understand that? Okay. So he keeps looking behind him, you know, Roger, you can see in the dark, you can kind of see what he's doing. You know, he's looking behind him and he keeps looking behind him. And then all of a sudden he counts off. Do you know this song in the flesh mm -hmm. counts off in the, and I think he counts it off in Italian or something, something like Vini, Vedi, Vici or something, you know, <laughs> and, and right on one, when they start, the song and all the lights come on the jet that we were flying on comes up out of the river and buzzes the crowd <laughs> can you believe that the fucking jet dude real jet <laughs> and like the crowds are going oh my god like you're not gonna you're never gonna see that again you're gonna fucking see no one's fucking flying a jet over the stage at the beginning of the show and i was just like and then he had quad sound you know like the surround sound was going all around the, the amphitheater oh my god it was crazy <laughs> can you believe it? so that's what they were talking about in the plane okay Remember i told you earlier like right and the roger and the captain they're like pointing out the window mm. they were plotting how to start the show how to buzz the crowd crazy no i went on to do another gig in um boise idaho and then we were on stage waiting for the second set to start and i start the second set with the band and i'm standing right next to roger in the dark the show hasn't started yet okay and roger we're going to uh, set the controls for the heart of the sun. Okay. And he's got an acoustic guitar and he leans over to me and he's like, Scary, do you fancy coming to Denver with us? <laughs> he, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm like, I'm like, Oh, sorry. I can't, you know, I have to go. I have a, I have to get back to Seattle. I have a recording project and he just looks at me like and then he just and then he counts off the song and the lights come on and he starts the song but he just looked at me like are you crazy you're not going to do this <laughs> with us because i had um to do a record with michael shreve you know drummer from santana 
and Reggie Watts, you know, Reggie Watts, he's a, he's a really well-known comedian and, uh, and great musician, singer. Um, we had this band called Trilon. And mm -hmm. so we had to go and do the, and so, but I was so mad for a long time because I gave up the rest of that tour to do this record, this Trilon record. And it never came out until just a few years ago. It took like almost 20 years for the record to come out. Cool. Um, yeah, Michael did a lot of different stuff. He was very creative, very active during that whole 80s and 90s, 2000s. He's crazy, very active. Oh man, I had so many things canceled. Uh, you know, I played on that new Nels Klein record. Yeah. It's called Share the Wealth. It's on Blue Note Records. Mm. Nels Klein, great guitar player, great composer, improviser, great, it's beautiful. Right? I can't believe I got to play on that. So happy. I love Nels and the band is amazing. It, it's really interesting record. Please check it out. It's really cool. So we were supposed to do some shows, you know, for the record release that never happened things but i did i did a bunch of stuff on my Bandcamp page can you listen to Bandcamp in czechoslovakia yeah please go to Bandcamp, the skerrick band camp <clears throat> and i have a lot of new music on there that i've made just during the pandemic and you know um some solo stuff and other things you know and critters bug and released we released two new records that were live things that were all mixed and altered mm -hmm. on the Critters Bug and Band Camp page too. It's really good stuff. Check it out. Um, our drummer Matt Chamberlain, he put uh he put those things together. He's really good at mixing and editing mm. or picking up all good stuff. So that and um we got the new Garage Atoi record like that's behind you. Mm -hmm. That just came out last week. Um, that's really, really cool record, really fun. Um, I play on the new Algiers record that came out last year. That's really great. I play on uh, Will Blades, Scott Amendola record. Mm -hmm. That's really cool with Jeff Parker on guitar. Long tones, long tones, <laughs> lots of breathing, doing yoga, mm -hmm. you know, you know, lots of that <clears throat> trying to, I'm still trying to learn how to play on a full breath. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of wind instrument players, sometimes you get into you know, just playing on a short breath instead of really long, just, you know, really playing from your diaphragm instead of your chest. So I'm always trying to practice that. Um, long tones. And, and then I'll practice songs, you know, memorizing songs, transcribing mm -hmm. solos, transcribing songs and writing so you know working out writing things that are on the saxophone recording it on my voice thing record it on my phone you know this little thing and then try and develop it make it better um and you know getting little patterns and keys i'm not as familiar with and just making making up etudes and making up riffs and things like that to strengthen the more unfamiliar scale shapes and keys you know i grew up playing in rock bands um and symphony orchestras so i'm i'm good at playing in a lot of sharp keys <laughs> <laughs> and playing in open string keys like e a <clears throat> thing you know uh, guitar keys and and violin keys so 
which is very strange. And then I played a lot of African music in the eighties too. So, which is all E major, a lot of Sukus, Congolese music. So um, I lived in London for a little while and I lived in Paris for a little while. So when I was living in London, I was playing all Sukus bands, played with Mose Fan Fan in Somo Somo. And it's all E major. So it's a lot of sharp for tenor sax. So I got, I got very comfortable and good playing in, you know, kind of all 12 keys. Mm -hmm which I like, it's, it's good. It's, it's helped me a lot when I go play with rock people, you know? I mean, I listen to a lot of Wayne Shorter, Joe Henderson, Stanley Turrentine, mm -hmm. uh, Dexter Gordon, uh, Pharaoh Sanders, John Coltrane, Ornette Coleman, um, people like that and always trying to learn their music and try and absorb some of their uh, perspective and vision and directions, you know. Um, and then listening to band leaders and how, how do they lead the band? How do they write for the band? How are they conceptualized for their bands? Like Miles Davis mm -hmm. in all the different areas, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, how does he pick the musicians? How, how, what compositions does he choose to play? What instrumentation is he using? Why is he using that instrumentation? You know, how is he recording in the studio? You know, what is he getting out of musicians in the studio? Why does he want that? You know, what is, you know, Miles Davis can teach you a lot about a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. You know, being open, you know, it doesn't matter who writes the song, as long as it's more, it's more important what song is best for the concept, you know, for the record. Um, and, you know, all these different textures and timbres and using different instruments. And, you know, that's like, it's just, there's just so many lessons there, you know. And then, you know, reading about like Ornette Coleman, such a, he's such a, uh, he's thinking about so many different things in life and philosophy and science and, and music and sociology and, human behavior and everything and it you know when you read quotes from him and read about his thoughts it's you can see why his music is so special and individual and um, unique to him because he's such a unique thinker and there's all very good influences I think for people I think it mostly happened, well, because I grew up really loving Jimi Hendrix, you know, since I was in like elementary school, because I had a neighbor kid who had all these great cassette tapes of all this, all the really good music in the 60s and 70s. I was very lucky to, I've always been really lucky to be, hang around people that had good taste in music, because I never was instigating it, you know, mm -hmm. I was always on the receiving end you know so i started playing with some friends of mine which be, which was that band sad happy i was telling you about and they were very loud and powerful and the bass player was like classically trained and he he could play bach violin concertos on on four string electric bass he was incredible so you know, they're playing all loud and, you know, saxophone is, he didn't really fit in to their music um, just as acoustic saxophone. So I borrowed a friend's like distortion pedal and was and started experimenting with that and it gave it a different texture and timbre that helped it fit in more, you know? And then I started asking people, because uh, there wasn't anything made for horns in the 80s, you know. Mm -hmm. 
everything was made for guitar, which is a completely different setup, you know, different signal and impedance. It's just all, it, it's always, it's been a very expensive, horrible journey. <laughs> like now it's so easy. You know, you can buy an Eventide mixing link or, a, you know, you can get a little preamp anywhere, a hundred bucks or whatever on eBay. But, you know, back then it was very difficult. <clears throat> so, um, but I heard the things in my head, you know, like I wanted to, you know, how Jimi Hendrix was getting those different sounds and all, he had so many different sounds and manipulating feedback, using the amp, you know, using his volume controls on his guitar, using the couple of pedals that he had, you know, just so expressive, and just so powerful and just, you know, he was using noise as notes, you know, mm. and that really got inspired by that, you know, the whole, so that's, you know, that's really fun, you know, and, you know, it was, a, it was a lot of fun learning about all that stuff. And then discovering, you know, the trumpet player, John Hassell, you know, John Hassell, mm -hmm. Like in the 80s, you know, he was recording with Daniel Lanois and Brian Eno. You know, he was processing his trumpet with harmonizers and everything. And he just had such a unique sound. I was like, you know, he was like, wow, what is he doing? What is that? And so all my synthesis friends and producer friends, you know, they knew how to get those sounds. And they were a lot of help to me. So uh, I learned a lot from... James Reynolds, this a really well-known engineer in Seattle, producer and musician. Um, and he was also a very conceptual person too. He was involved in theater and laser shows and everything. And he wrote a lot of synthesizer patches for big companies, you know, Waldorf and Alesis and all kinds of companies. He's, you know, so he's like super intellectual you know, in, in terms of programming and knowledge about um, the technical side of music gear and the conceptual side of translating that to people in a performance kind of theater way. So it was, a, I was lucky to have the, those people around to, to learn from. So yeah, but now it's crazy. I got my own studio and then I got a lot of stuff. I'm not at the studio now. I wish I could show you, but we got a lot of crazy. <laughs> the effects thing is nuts now. It's nutty. Uh, do you practice with the effects? Yeah, sometimes. So if you go to my Bandcamp page, there's a new performance I did last month a live performance <clears throat> and it's called Steve Molly, M-A-L-I. Mm -hmm. And so what I'll do is I'll pick an effects rig, you know? So if I have, let's say I have a hundred pedals, I'll pick 10 of them or something or five of them and just commit to that um, array, right? And then I'll try and build a, a show using just those pedals. And they're all, if you go to my YouTube channel, there's, um, there's a one thing that shows all the pedals for this, for another performance I did. It's got, it's huge. It's like got keyboards and drum machines, and, you know, all kinds of crap. Okay. It's, and then I go and talk about each of the pedals, you know, you can go and, Go to Scaric YouTube channel, okay. <laughs> check it out. But yeah, but so to answer your question, yeah, I'll pick, you know, pick out a certain effects and then build a show. And so about two months, let's if the show is in two months, I'll set that up and I'll practice the show. Like I'll set a timer, it's like 45 minute show and I'll run the show every day for two months. So the first month is experimenting and trying to figure out what sounds work the best, which effects work the best. And then the second month is 
fine tuning, you know, you've chosen all the effects and all of the programs you're going to use within those effects. And you have an arc for the show, beginning, middle and end, what you're going to do. And then I start recording it. So that last show, I rehearsed every day for two months. And then the second month, I recorded it every day. And then so I would perform the show with a timer and then listen to it afterwards. Like, oh, that sucks. Oh, that's good. Okay. All right. Get rid of that. Use that. And just every day fine tuning it, you know, that's what a lot of those shows have. If you go on my YouTube channel, there's there's a couple of bigger shows too, the long form shows. And then on the Bandcamp page, it has more of the refined ready for uh, that have been mixed and edited, you know, like into the most concise kind of form. You know, I heard Eddie Harris playing with the veritone, you know, in the thing and it really wasn't it really didn't hit me as much you know like i i thought john hassell was that was more interesting to me you know and eddie harris that, that's someone i study like all the time i didn't mention him earlier but you know his book the intervalistic mm. concept like i've been using that book for years and his music is incredible he's a genius composer and he's one of the last real innovators you know mm -hmm. after coltrane you know coltrane eddie harris and really no one has contributed to the enhancement of harmonic you know original ideas or whatever since eddie essentially but he's just i, I love his music his playing he's just incredible individual artist amazing so um but but in terms of effects <clears throat> not so much did not as an influence mm -hmm. yeah so it's mostly like Jimi hendrix john hassell and then you know friends of mine or keyboardists or you know brian eno and people like that you know thank you very much brother Greetings to Seattle and hope to see you playing live around here. I know, man. I want to come back to Prague uh, very soon, I hope, you know. Yeah, man. Stay Last safe. Time. Stay healthy, everyone.